Thank you.
Good morning, church family. How is everyone today on this snowy March morning? Uh, I just want to encourage you to take us to stand up, greet somebody um, before we get started this morning. Hi. <laughs> All right, everybody, if you can make your way back to your seats. If you're watching online this morning, welcome. We're glad you could join us in worshiping the Lord on Palm Sunday. I'm just going to read from John 12, 13. Jesus, when he came into Jerusalem... The people took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Lord, I just want to thank you for coming to this earth, knowing full well what you had to do to save us. We are not worthy, but God, you love us. And so I just pray that this morning, Holy Spirit, you would stir in us a hosanna, that we would lift our voices to the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is worthy. He is good. He is faithful. And whatever you're going through this morning, he wants to meet with you right here where you're at. So what I would encourage you this morning is just to lay it down Lift up your voice, lift up your eyes to him as we worship this morning. Put your hands together. Who breaks the power? darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in nine wonder the king of glory the king above all kings you've done for me. Shut 
like the sky all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings yeah this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross
from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead. We are one with him again. Come away, come away. Come and rise up from the grave.
what and pain find in me thy all in all sing it out Jesus Jesus paid it all, all to him Sin had left a Jesus washed in white as snow Yes, he washed give you thanks for washing us white as snow. And we ask that you would continue to change us and to move through us this morning. All we can say is thank you. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Thank you for joining us this morning, and thank you, worship team. Uh, it was beautiful. Um, just a quick announcement before we bring Renee up to share a TLT update. Uh, just want to make sure that all of you know and are aware and are feeling invited to come to our Good Friday service at 10 a.m. this Friday, and it's just an hour long, or you'll be here for about an hour, and so it's just a really wonderful time to celebrate and to ponder and to contemplate all that Jesus has done for us by going to that cross on that Friday. And so we encourage you to come uh, join us 10 a.m. on Good Friday, this coming Friday. And then, of course, our Easter Sunday service following on that Sunday will be a wonderful time of celebration. We encourage you to come and bring your family and friends uh, to our Easter celebration. Good morning, church. Yeah, I'm Renee Holstrung, one of the elders and one of the or the chair of the TLT. Um, I wanted to start um, this morning just with some thanks and some thanksgiving for everybody who put together last weekend's events regarding our call weekend for Pastor Dave Spate. And to those in men's ministry who helped set up the chairs and tables, to Dean Ham and his team and his wonderful team who coordinated the Saturday and Sunday lunch, to all of you who contributed towards the potluck and the cleanup afterwards. It was a great potluck, wasn't it? And uh, I was one of the last people to eat there, and there's still so much food at the end. So hats off to you and everyone who contributed to that. Also to Rodney Dietzman for hosting our Q&A session for all of your questions that you submitted. We're, we're sorry we couldn't get to all of them. There was a lot of questions that were there, and uh, we just didn't have time for all of them. But I just wanted to say, well done, SVBC. Thank you for all your contributions to make that event a success. On Tuesday, following the recommendation from leadership to proceed with an affirmation vote, we had our congregational meeting to discern whether or not we would call Pastor Dave. I'm pleased to report that 88% of the members present affirmed that decision. It wasn't without some drama, though, as th those who were there can attest to. Who knew that Robert's Rules of Orders would play such a significant part? But uh, following the meeting, I discussed the results uh, and how the meeting went overall with Pastor Dave and his wife, Kathy. He asked for a time to pray about this and with his wife, and then the next afternoon, he informed me that he had accepted the call to serve here at SVBC. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> the, 
The next steps now are that Gord Martin and John Craig are going to commence contract negotiations with the ABA first. Pastor Dave's on a much needed vacation. He's uh, somewhere exotic, uh, taking a, a much needed vacation on a cruise with his family. And uh, that those negotiations should be finalized sometime after Easter once Pastor Dave is back from vacation. We also haven't finalized exactly the start date for him yet, um, but have communicated to Pastor Dave that we're hoping that he could start sometime in early May. We will keep you updated on that in the weeks ahead. Pastor Dave has mentioned to me when I spoke to him uh, earlier this week that he's been requested to do several baptisms there at Dalhousie uh, before he goes, and it just depends on when that timing is going to happen for that. I also want to acknowledge that there were concerns raised at the congregational meeting that some of them we didn't have answers to. Some things were things I've never heard of before, so I couldn't comment on them, nor could I represent Pastor Dave's response to them. Rest assured, leadership has taken note of all of this, and we plan to discuss this with Pastor Dave upon his return from vacation after Easter. We will advise the congregation how we will proceed on those issues in the weeks ahead. For now, let's pray for this transition to go well. For Pastor Dave, and especially to accomplish those things that unite us as a congregation, not divide us. We won't make any TLT announcements. You'll probably be happy to hear that for a bit. Now until after Easter sometime unless there is something important to share. Our team has been very busy in the past few weeks, and we look forward to a bit of a break. Uh, I want to thank each one of the TLT members as well for all of their efforts. It is so appreciated. And as always, feel free to contact any of us or connect with any of us on the TLT should you have any questions or concerns. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, just a few updates for kids' ministry. Uh, today's Palm Sunday, so it's a week before Easter. Uh, so if you're wanting to do something with your kids or grandkids, um, we have some activities. Uh, it's from Focus on the Family. So it's not exhaustive, but if you wanted some place to start, uh, you can grab one of these. There's um, some copies for crafts that there's only one of, but we have extras at the kids' kiosk, so feel free to just grab however many you need. Uh, if we run out, I'll be upstairs after the service, so just let me or the hall monitor know, and we'll get you some copies today before you go home. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. Also, upstairs in the library, Katie has put up all the Easter books for kids, and so it's a lovely display in there. So head up there, take out some books for Easter. You can keep them all week, two weeks if you want to read them after Easter too. Uh, so make sure you check those out as well. Um, and April's not far away, and uh, we have in the works um, an event for parents. Uh, or grandparents. Uh, so there'll be more information about that, but I just wanted to give you a heads up that we do have something planned for parents and uh, grandparents. Uh, it's going to be a bit of fellowship and learning time. So I'm looking forward to that, and I'll share more after Easter. Um, and lastly, we had our volunteer training, one of a few, because not everyone could come, so we'll have uh, at least one more. Um, but it was just such a great reminder how how much God provides for us. He's provided um, the people we need all year to run our kids' church on Sunday mornings. And they are awesome volunteers. They love Jesus. They want to share Jesus with your kids. They love your kids. And uh, so I just, if you see a volunteer today or in the weeks to come that have been helping in kids' ministry this year, just give them a thank you. And uh, it's always good to have a little encouragement. So uh, that's all. Thank you. And kids, we can head upstairs. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, this Sunday's leader prayer looks a little bit different. Um, Pastor Walter if asked yesterday if I, had, if I was willing to read the scripture for today, to which I humbly agreed. Um, the scripture for this morning is Luke uh, 23, uh, verse 32 to 49. I do not know what page that is on the Bible in front of you, so, but I'm sure you can find it if you wanted to follow along. Um, now, two others who are criminals we're also being led away to be put to death with him. 
And when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing his garments among themselves. And the people stood by watching, and even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also ridiculed him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was also an inscription above him, saying, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other responded, and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our crimes. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the entire land until the ninth hour, because the sun stopped shining, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. And having said this, he died. Now when the centurion saw what had happened, he began praising God, saying, This man was in fact innocent. And all the crowds who came together for the spectacle, after watching what had happened, began to return home, beating their chests. And all his acquaintances and the woman who accompanied him from Galilee were standing at a distance, seeing these things. Would you pray with me? Father, we gather today to worship and praise you for who you are and what you have done. You are mighty, powerful, and our Savior. Thanks be to you, God. Today we acknowledge your grace, abounding love, and your great sacrifice so that we may be set free. You are truly incredible. We pray today for those who feel lost, those that feel lonely and trapped, and to those that seek rest but are unable to. You remind us that you allow all things to work for good to those that love you. Remind us, God, that even though we are sinners and feel like we failed, you raise us up over our struggles. Father, we know that the enemy is plotting schemes throughout this generation, especially the rising generations, including youth. We pray that your hand and power will guide us to stand and fight back. Lead us to call on you during these times of trial and temptation. Addiction is rampant today, along with depression and a loss of hope amongst many. We pray for your accountability amongst your children today, leading us to the raging storm. We declare that the enemy certainly has no hold anymore on those who've fallen and got back up. We thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you that we can gather together to worship and praise you in assurance knowing that you will protect us. We thank you for your day-to-day -day guidance in our lives. We declare our faith in you, God, today. You are amazing. In all these things we sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Savior, I come, quiet my soul, remember, redemption's hill, where your blood was spilled, for my ransom, everything I was held dear, I counted all as lost. Lead me to the cross where your blood poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Bring me up myself.
tempted and tried you the word became flesh for my sin and death now you're This allows me to uh, spread the papers, also interpreted by some that it might be a longer sermon. <laughs> good morning. And trust you had a good week. And we look forward as to what the Lord has for us from His Word this morning. This is, uh, of course, the beginning of what often is called Holy Week. It's Palm Sunday. This means that we are very close to Good Friday. And uh, Pastor Justin announced uh, the service on Good Friday, which also includes a time of communion. I came across this phrase that sums it up recently. Under the eastern sky, amid, amid the rabble's cry, a man went forth to die. Today we want to explore what happened at the foot of the cross of Jesus. We want to focus on Calvary, the place of three crosses. Luke puts it this way, as we already heard the Scripture. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with Jesus to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, there he crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other one on his left. Indeed, Calvary is the place of three crosses. Now to us 2,000 years removed from that awful day, one cross, of course, stands out. But it most likely would not have looked like that for the casual spectator on that day. Had it not been for the extraordinary things that happened and were said from the cross, the words Jesus spoke, the words the criminals spoke, the agony, the crowd, the darkness. Crucifixion was the Roman way of executing criminals, or those who had rebelled against Rome. It meant 
to be a public spectacle to serve as a deterrent for other lawbreakers. It was the most horrible death possible. So we've always seen the picture of three crosses. And so we ask sometimes, why three crosses? Well, there's several reasons, and I don't know if any one of them is the specific one. It was less work for the soldiers if they could execute several convicts at the same time. It was a very public way to humiliate Jesus. Another reason, not only Jesus, but his followers. Most likely the priests and the rulers wanted Jesus crucified in the middle because in their minds he was the greatest criminal of them, of the tree. They wanted to maximize the humiliation of Jesus in front of the crowd. Of course, you see, they had believed Satan's lie. It was also a picture of how Jesus led his life. Luke 19, verse 19 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. And even in his death, he was surrounded by lost people. It also fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah 53, verse 12. And we're familiar with Isaiah, at least a good number of us, uh, Isaiah 53. And verse 12 says this, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. Jesus did not die alone. Now, we realize that God was present there as well, but he had two human companions with him. The crosses were the same. The the methods were the same, yet the three men were very different from each other. Jesus, of course, was without sin. The others, of course, were criminals. So let's look at the three crosses and those who were on them. What do they teach us? What can we glean from that this morning in a very specific way? First of all, there is, of course, the cross of rebellion. On the cross of rebellion was a shameless and hardened man. Verse 39, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insult at him, aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. He was doing much more than just teasing Jesus. He was bitter and sarcastic, as he, of course, had been throughout his life, it appears. He would not have started out that way, but he had turned out to be that. He was spurning the good even in the day of his dying. It has been said that he was cursing his way to hell in the most solemn day of all of history. He threw away his chance of forgiveness. He died as he had lived in sin. Now he spoke to Jesus like the other one did. Save yourself and us. Of course, when you read the other Gospels, and all four Gospels report the crucifixion of Jesus, not all of them report specifically on the birth of Jesus, but they do about his crucifixion and his death and his resurrection. You see, this man wanted to be delivered by Jesus from his pain. But he wanted a Christ without a cross. He wanted relief, but without repentance. And even today, many seek a Christ that will fulfill their dreams, but not one who would save them from their sin, who would change their lives. They're not interested in changed lives. They want someone to fulfill their dreams, but without the changed life. The truth is that this continues to happen in lives of people who reject Jesus today. 
Some are indifferent to the gospel. They don't necessarily reject Jesus, but they are indifferent. A pastor was working in a gym when he briefly struck up a conversation with, with the man next to him working out on some other equipment. They commented how good it feels to exercise, and indeed it does, doesn't it? Then the man said to the pastor, of course he didn't know it was a pastor, this is all there is to life. We just have to stay in shape to keep healthy. Pastor slowly nodded and then said, we need to work on the inside as well because this outside stuff is just going to turn into dust eventually. We're just prolonging the process. It's going to catch up with us sooner or later. To which the man just kind of looked at the pastor and sort of shook his head and sort of said, well, yeah. But never responded to what really mattered. You see, this thief on the cross, even in these last moments, would not focus on what really mattered. He remained in a state of rebellion. This is the way many people live their lives, even today. They don't really care. They might say, oh, whatever happens, happens. In fact, this generation has been called by some the sort of whatever generation. In fact, the clinical psychologist told me this some years ago at a wedding, a wedding uh, related to Grace's family. He uh, is a clinical psychologist in one of the uh, uh, neighborhoods that are pretty tough in Chicago. And he told me this. He said, there's so many that come and I see them and they say, oh, whatever. And shrug their shoulders, whatever. Uh, and then he told me this, they never or seldom deal with the issues that matter in life and in our society. Sounds familiar? Yeah. But then there is the cross of repentance. The other criminal hung on the other cross, on the other side of Jesus. And we call it the cross of repentance. But he and his buddy were being punished for their crimes. Yet he was different because he recognized that Jesus was different. He did not deserve to die. Even though at the beginning, both of these guys uh, were insulting Jesus, and we find this in Mark 15, 32, and I found that in the other Gospels as well. Luke does not report that, but the others do. So obviously, that's what was happening. They, all, they both had uh, insulted Jesus when the day began. But then something happened. You see, this, this one thief opened his eyes, opened his ears and his heart, he heard what Jesus was saying, and he was convicted of his own wickedness when contrasted with the righteousness of Christ. Instead of curses from the lips of Jesus, what did he hear? He heard a prayer of forgiveness or for forgiveness. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. It's definitely possible that this expression of grace and forgiveness Soften the thief's heart, hardened heart. And he rebuked the other criminal, saying, Don't you fear God? He said, Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly for we're getting what we, our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Can you imagine the courage it took to defy the influence? of his friend, and the mockery of the crowd. So what we find here is this man demonstrated saving faith in four areas. He respected God. 
even though he had done horrible things, he now recognized and he respected God. And then he admitted his guilt. We deserve to die. He knew that he needed to be punished. Romans 6, 23 says this, for the wages of sin is death. So he confessed Christ. He knew that Jesus was sinless and righteous. He started to see Jesus had done nothing wrong and that he could ultimately give him salvation. How did he know? Well, we're not told exactly. Maybe he had heard Jesus teach or heard him forgive those who were crucifying him. Uh, maybe he had seen some of the miracles. Some suggest that maybe he had been in the crowd and uh, did some stealing, some pickpocket. You know? Could have been. You know, God is amazed how he <laughs> brings people to himself. He could have grown up in a home where it was taught about the Messiah or the words Jesus has already said spoke from the cross. The fact that Jesus did not curse like the rest did. And so he asked for salvation. Verse 42, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And this is so very important when it comes to saving faith. He did more than just respect God. He owed up to his guilt and saw Jesus as sinless. He also reached out to Jesus to remember him. He was doing what John 1, 12, Gospel of John, right in the first chapter says, yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The response from Jesus was immediate in verse 43. I tell you the truth, said Jesus, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus said, today. As soon as you take your last breath, you will be with me in paradise. You see, Jesus saved the man while he was on the cross. And this is important. A man not fit to live on earth, Jesus made fit to live in heaven. Isn't God amazing? It's His grace beyond human comprehension. You see, and then the cross of repentance teaches us some valuable lessons. Salvation is simple. We have this idea that it could not be that simple. The devil has blinded the eyes of men, women, boys, and girls into thinking that it's hard to be saved. It's next to impossible because we're not good enough. But this clearly is not true. The man on the cross was saved simply by asking the Lord to save him. Now in the words of the request, there is surely an attitude of repentance as he threw himself on the mercy of Jesus. And that is all that is necessary to be saved. Repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And then we find that the worst can be saved. Now this man on the cross was a lawbreaker. He had broken the law of the land. He was Christ crucified for that reason, and of course, he had sinned against God. But no one is too bad to be saved. For as the hymn writer puts it so well, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receive. There's clear proof here that Jesus can save the unholy, 
the unfit, the unclean, but he doesn't save the unwilling. We have to be willing to come to Christ. And then it is never too late to come to Christ in this life. And the key is this life. No, 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 we are not to wait and wait because now like this, this, this thief on the cross did. Because death can come at any moment. You see, the, the thief on the cross had one final chance, and he took it. We have chances. And I trust you have taken that opportunity. If not, you can do that today. And this, this applies to, to, to all of us as we share our faith, because we never know if that person we share our faith with will have another opportunity. And so we need to use the opportunities God gives us to share our faith. And we never know when that's going to come. Let me tell us just a little personal story. About five or so years ago, we traveled from, from uh, the L.A. area, Los Angeles areas, to Phoenix. Um, and uh, we had a flat. And I think that was in God-appointed flat. Uh, at that moment, I didn't think so, but <laughs> at least I recognized that that might have been the reason why we had that flat. And um, I called Grace's brother. I said, such and such is happening. Well, he says, I know there was an issue with that tire. Well, okay, it hadn't been fixed, but that's beside the point. So, so uh, AAA came, and uh, it was very hot. We had just crossed into uh, the state of California from, uh, uh, state of Arizona from California. So they came. But this fellow just did not want to change that tire. <laughs> and he said, well, I'll, I'll inflate it. And anyway, that's a long story. We uh, kept on going. He said, I cover the next 50 miles. Here is my cell number. Should you have a problem, I will come and get you from the interstate. But there is a tire shop in the next exit. <laughs> and that exit was like 30 miles away, which is 50 kilometers. And sure enough, uh, I stopped and checked the, the pressure, and uh, uh, we were losing air rapidly. So then I asked, where is that uh, tire shop? Well, it's across the street. I said, there's nothing there. Well, it's outdoors. <laughs> so we get there, and sure enough, somebody just pulled away, and we were able to get in, and all the gentlemen came to help us. And yeah, allowed uh, some to stay in the vehicle because of, of, of the heat. Uh, and um, then when he went inside his little office he had, um, he, he uh, wrote out the receipt and said, oh my goodness, how quick time goes. And then he pointed to a picture on, on his little billboard that he had of a friend that had just died at the age of 50-some. And I uh, said, well, and, and, and some other people were starting to come in. And I said to him, you know, that just shows you that we need to be ready at any time to meet the Lord, to meet our Maker. He says, yes, th that's so they say. So they say. Well, I said, you know, let's make sure we are ready to meet our Maker. And by then, somebody else came in, and I, I don't know what he did with that information, but I had that opportunity to tell him. And we never know when it's going to happen. So let's use the little opportunities we get to, to witness, to share our faith. Uh, the cross of repentance speaks of hope and assurance but it was only made possible by the third cross, by the sinless Son of God. So let's talk about the cross of redemption.
You see, here we tread on holy ground. This man has done nothing wrong. That's what the thief said. The one had, that had just asked Jesus to remember when he came into his kingdom. The words of the repentant criminal are a remarkable testimony of the character of Jesus. Skeptics have scrutinized the life of Jesus, and yet no flaw has ever been found. In John 8, 46, Jesus asked a question that no one has ever been able to answer. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? Now, we know the answer. The answer is no. No one has been able or will be able At this trial, no grounds had been established on which he could justly be condemned. So why then did Jesus die? Was it all a big miscarriage of justice? You see, from the human point of view, there is no greater blot on human history than the story of Calvary. It is history's darkest atrocity. But to be understood, it has to be seen as the climax of God's glorious plan of redemption. It's the climax of God's glorious plan of redemption for you and me. That's how the Apostle Paul saw it and said so in 2 Corinthians 5, 19, and then also in 21. Let's read both verses. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself. And then verse 21, God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. The middle cross was is was the cross of redemption. The death of Christ was very different from the other two. The other two died because they had done wrong. They had made bad choices and acted upon them. And so their lives were being taken away. But it was quite or very different with Jesus. In fact, in advance to His crucifixion, he told his disciples in John 10, 17, these words, I lay down my life. Nobody took his life. He laid down his life that I may take it up again. No one, in verse 18, in John chapter 10, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. It was planned. The death of Jesus was inevitable because He decided that is what He was going to do to redeem us. His death was a voluntary sacrifice. The just for the unjust. The righteous for the unrighteous. 1 Peter 3.18 You see, his death became the substitute for our sin. Evil did its worst on Calvary. You see, wicked hands crucified the Lord of life. But where man's rebellion against God reached its limit, the grace of God shines through in all its splendor. Hmm. Let's repeat that. But where man's rebellion against God reached its limit, the grace of God shines through in all its splendor. Yes, and that's why we're here this morning. Jesus took our place on the cross. He was the only one who had lived a sinless life. No human being has ever done that. And God in His righteousness, you see, God in His righteousness has to punish every sin that has ever or will be committed. Because if God lets one sin unpunished, He is not a just God anymore. And that's not going to happen. Because He's God. So Jesus took all that sin, all that punishment we deserved. 
that mankind deserved, and thus satisfied the righteousness of God. No, He did not buy us back from Satan. No. He made us righteous before God. Thus, He restores He made it possible that that relationship which God intended to have with us and which, of course, was interrupted in the Garden of Eden by our first parents because He created in in, in His own image for fellowship with Him. We're destined for that. I remember I said that about three weeks ago. He crushed serpent's head, Genesis 3.15. The question becomes, what cross best describes us today? In a sense, everyone in the world is in one of those two crosses, symbolically, of course. We're all guilty and deserve, of course, to die. So which cross are you on today? the cross of rebellion or the cross of repentance. The cross of repentance leads to salvation and eternal life, which God wants for us. The cross of rebellion leads to death and eternal separation from God. Now, of course, the cross of rebellion teaches us that no one should put off a decision to follow Christ. We're all in need of the cross of redemption. Now, that's not to say we need to make a public confession every Sunday and come forward and all that sort of thing. That's not what we're talking about. But each day we need to, what I like to call, and I tell myself that, to be confessed and prayed up to date. You sleep better that way. Wouldn't you agree? Uh... You see, because of the cross of redemption, we have to choose between rebellion and repentance. To not choose between is to choose rebellion. Look at the cross of redemption. See Him there with His outstretched arms waiting to grant forgiveness to all who come to Him in repentance and faith under an eastern sky, amid a rabble's cry, a man went forth to die for you and me. There were many people who were instrumental in crucifying Jesus. There were the teachers of the law, the Pharisees who hated Him, the traitor who sold Him, the priests who bought Jesus' betrayal, the people who said, crucify Him, crucify Him, and even the disciples who deserted Him. But you see, the story remains academic unless we reach, or unless each of us admit, I was there too. My sins nailed Him to the cross. My sins nailed them to the cross. Christianity is nothing at all if it's not personal. In a very sense, you and I were at Calvary. So who nailed Jesus to the cross? If you look closely in your mind, you see the hammer in your hand. I see it in mine. You and I, our sin, nailed Him to the cross. He took our punishment. Now, you've seen an insert today that maybe you wondered about Something very simple. It's, it's a simple cross. Now, this is bigger than yours because I printed it off from the website. It's on there, church website. 
as an insert this morning. And today we want to just focus on that cross for a moment. Uh, and for you to be able to maybe now or when you take it home, write down what you're specifically struggling with in your spiritual life uh, and to leave it with Jesus. Nail it to the cross. <laughs> Nail it to the cross. Remember the song. Then came the morning. The garden, the jail, the hammer, the nail. How could the night be so long? The fact is, Jesus took the nails. He took the night for you and me and turned them into day. So let's confess what we need to confess and leave it with Jesus. And I'm saying we because there are things that we all struggle with from time to time. So turn it over to Jesus. You will be forgiven because Jesus already died for your sin, for mine. The very sin you struggle with, I, I don't know what it is, but you do, and Jesus knows. It might be as simple as envy. And one thing that I just wrote in this morning could be greed, but it could also be bitterness, unforgiveness, a broken relationship, someone you have not talked to for a while and you need to talk to. It could be neglect or indifference to God's Word, and you're here today for a reason, some deep sadness. You've, we've all talked to people or perhaps experienced our, ourselves some very deep sadness of, caused by all kinds of things. Sometimes it's grief. Um, I mean, this is a symbol. Um, but <clears throat> I shared it with several of you and uh, and, and this is no bragging right on mine. I preached a couple thousand, for sure, sermons. And it's always a bit of a struggle before because Satan does not want us to say certain things. And he doesn't like the cross. He denies the cross. That's because that's where he is defeated and continues to be defeated. It's the blood of Jesus. You see, Jesus did it all for us because He loves us. He loves you with an everlasting love. So leave whatever brokenness you have in your life with Jesus. Leave it with Him. He can and will heal that brokenness as you sincerely, and this is so important, sincerely and unconditionally leave it with Him. The tendency is that sometimes we leave it with him and then we go and pick it up again. We've been there, right? Remember, that's why he went to the cross. Because he loves you. So let's take a moment to write these things down if you'd like now or just in your mind. Just... Uh, Say so these are these are these are very very holy moments. Um, this is what Jesus came for. You see, it's no gimmick. It was not then. It isn't now. Let's take a few moments in silence.
remember again. Jesus on the cross of redemption is there for us every day and every hour. And praise God, he did not stay on the cross. He rose again. I have a few more words that I will say at the end after the music team comes. And I will say them from down below. Because we're preparing for communion on Friday. In our hearts, in our minds, throughout this holy week. Amen. If you'd like to stand with us as we sing about the wonderful cross.
Indeed, we thank Jesus for the cross. He took our place. Isn't it interesting that we never are called to commemorate the birth of Jesus? We're not commanded that in Scripture. We do. But one request where Jesus, what Jesus commands us to do is to remember him in his death. And that we do that through communion. And so we always need to prepare our hearts <laughs> for that. Um, and he told us to observe that until he comes again. And so we will do that on Friday. It's only appropriate that we would do it on Friday. He tells us to remember. Uh, you see, the cross of redemption is so key. And I don't know if you wrote anything down, and that's fine. If you had something that you needed to confess, you confessed it to the Lord, you're forgiven. Praise God. And if you haven't, do it at the end of the week. This is Holy Week. <laughs> Set aside, in a sense. So let's all be encouraged this Holy Week to spend time in prayer, praise, thanksgiving, and confession at the cross of redemption, at the cross of Jesus. Of course, He didn't stay there. He rose from the dead on the third day and lives and reigns forevermore. Yes, He's coming again as Lord of lords and King of kings. He is the Savior who wants to spend eternity with you and me. Isn't that wonderful? Let's thank Him. Father, we praise You. We worship You. We thank You, Father, for the prayers that have been prayed, the uh, things that have been confessed. Uh, Father, we want to make this a very special week in our own lives in dedication to you because you loved us with that everlasting love. And so, Father, as we go from here, we would go refreshed, encouraged, because you took our place. You took that very sin we confessed, even now, uh, to the cross. And we praise you. We thank you. Thank you for the peace that Jesus gives. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. There will be some of our elders of arm that will come if you come to the front. Thank you. 